With the closure of Telltale, I'm a bit saddened to think that we may never see something like Puzzle Agent again. Made in conjunction with artist and animator Graham, uh, I'm going with uh, an Apple, uh, Puzzle Agent is a game about exactly what it sounds like. You're an FBI agent who investigates a case that happens to involve solving a lot of puzzles. Copying Anabel's weird and wonderful art style, the game pulls a number of references to Fargo and Twin Peaks and is wrapped around some pretty fun brain teasers. While it's not one of Telltale's better-known titles, the sudden implosion of the company made me think back on all the games of theirs I played, and I realized Puzzle Agent had a pretty big impact on my trajectory into the industry. See, I'm fascinated with horror. While most games have players master systems in order to make them feel powerful and assured, with individual exceptions here and there, horror is the only real genre in games whose stated goal is evoking any other emotion. Trying to figure out how it works, though, is difficult. When people aren't being so reckless as to write off jump scares completely, a lot of rhetoric used in describing it is very hand-wavy. Oh, it's all about the environment of unease you construct, man, and jump scares are bad if you use them too much, they wear out over time. Puzzle Agent is very obviously not a horror game, with it being very goofy and lighthearted for most of its time. There are moments, however, where it does get surreal and creepy, and I will admit, the first time I played this game, there were two specific moments that got a good shock out of me. Existing outside of the horror genre, I was able to avoid getting tripped up on trappings like mood and themes, and focus solely on the execution of these frightening moments. So, in remembrance of all the labor of the people at Telltale over the years, I wanted to make a short video celebrating Puzzle Agent and sharing how it helped me understand how to make a good scare. Okay, so you know those brain teaser books you got as a kid in your Easter basket because Easter is just a shittier Christmas when you're raised Catholic? Puzzle Agent is just basically puzzles from those, made digital, with a point-and-click narrative presentation wrapped around it. The game has the player take the role of Agent Nelson Tethers, the FBI's only puzzle agent. Tethers is assigned to investigate the closure of an eraser factory in Scoggins, Wisconsin, because this factory happens to supply erasers to the president so he can fix his mistakes. Th this game came out in 2010. So the game mostly involves moving from location to location, talking with characters to get information, and very frequently solving problems they have in the form of brain teasers. Solving these advances the plot, aside from an optional puzzle here and there that's not on the main path. From here, the player can go to talk to the next character, or find the next interactable and click on it, prompting the next puzzle to appear. You know, it's like there's this cyclical structure in the gameplay, almost in the uh, circular repeating fashion, if you will. After a couple of these, it's understood that the puzzles are an abstraction. Agent Tethers isn't literally standing around solving a puzzle in the middle of wherever he happens to be. The puzzle just serves as a symbol for the activity he's engaging in, whether that's following directions on a map, plating a meal, or finding a key in a fish. Um, as the player starts a puzzle and as they end it, they see that the world around them remains in more or less the same state, building the assumption that time is frozen around them while they solve the puzzle, or that the time it takes to solve the puzzle is extremely dilated. Maybe it's best if I walk through one of these. So, the player checks into an inn fairly early in the plot, goes out and does some investigating, then comes back. Upon returning, they hear a crash and a scream from inside, only to find out that the stovepipe has collapsed, providing the next puzzle. Reassembling it is designed as this sort of pipe dream problem, requiring the player to rotate tiles to fit the stove back together. All it takes is to uh, rotate this and a couple of other... Oh god! Stole a puzzle piece? What the fuck? I know garden gnomes are a bit silly, but this genuinely got to me the first time. Part of its effectiveness is that it shattered an expectation that the player didn't know they were making, that being, the world cannot touch me while I'm in a puzzle. 
but it also had to do this at the right time, and to elaborate on what that timing is, I'm going to need to actually explain the concept of a gameplay loop instead of vaguely gesturing to it as some substitution for a joke. The term found its way into general usage a couple of years ago, but whenever I hear someone refer to a gameplay loop, it always seems to be in one specific context. There's a certain understanding that comes intuitively in hearing this term, a repeating structure that defines the rhythm of play. In Mario 3, for instance, you enter a level blocking your path, beat the level, clear that part of the path, and then move on to the next level. In Doom, a bunch of demons appear in a room, uh, you kill them all, and you head to the next room, where a bunch of more demons appear. And while this finding is still worthwhile, the structure itself is never really interrogated, and neither are its implications on other aspects of design. I might be tempted to say that someone dug up the term to win an internet argument, and then it spread because others started using it as a strategy, and then it got old and died off in spite of being a useful concept, but that would require something to back up that claim. Unfortunately, I have evidence. In my view, gameplay loops model the process of a player solving a problem. There's not really a consensus on them, but I like to break them down into four parts. First, the player collects information about the problem. They get a mental map of the space, they observe what obstacles are there, and they figure out what they want to get out of the situation and what's blocking them from that. Second, based on this information, they'll start planning. Okay, if I just move this thing, I can get to where I need, but then how do I do that? Third, once the player feels like they have a plan they can act on, they start executing it. Lastly, once executed, the player observes their results. If the plan worked, the player often gets a reward and can go on to the next obstacle where the loop will repeat. And if the plan failed, well, they have to reassess their current situation and the loop also repeats. There are contexts where this may not be applicable. Sometimes problems in games make the player act impulsively, not giving them much of a chance for planning. And there are other games where the player solves problems, but the input for each of these is so different it feels more like a linear string of isolated puzzles than any repetitive structures. Hell, some games are just so weird I'm not sure you could identify a loop in them. But for most games, this structure can be used to describe patterns in the game that are roughly a minute to a few minutes in length. As such, they're often referred to as minute-to-minute -minute loops. And I could go further, showing how minute-to-minute -minute loops can be broken down into a series of smaller second-to-second -second loops, and how minute-to-minute -minute loops in turn can be strung together to create hour-to-hour -hour loops, and how some games run with that and create day-to-day, week-to-week, and sometimes month-to-month -month loops, but we're not going to need that for this video. Uh, what exactly, then, can we do with this new information, and how the hell does this apply to Puzzle Agent? Well, here's my theory. As outlined before, the minute-to-minute -minute loop of Puzzle Agent is centered around, well, puzzles. The player moves through the story before hitting a point in the plot that's an excuse for a puzzle, then the player observes the rules, plans how to solve it, tries to execute the plan, and then observes their results. But the other thing we have to understand is that both creating the plan and executing the plan are the points at which the player is at peak cognitive load. I went over the topic in my video on Alien Isolation, but briefly. Working memory is where the brain can actually store and manipulate information as part of problem solving. There's a limited amount that we can keep track of, though, and that amount is referred to as cognitive load. The higher cognitive load, the more stressed a person is likely to be, but typically this means they will be more focused on the task at hand. So, for example, when someone's watching a horror movie and a scare happens and they say, oh, that didn't get to me, I saw that scare coming from a mile away, this implies that the audience member didn't have a lot of cognitive load at that time. Instead of processing what's going on in front of them during the scene, they were already anticipating future events. As such, when said future events match their expectations, it's not really a surprise. So keeping an audience member with a certain amount of information to process in their working memory may help prevent this. Because the player is storing the most information while planning and executing, this implies that this point in the gameplay loop is the best time to shock them. 
And where does that scare in puzzle agent happen? Right as the player is mid solving the puzzle. Now, the structure of the game doesn't really imply that a scare is going to happen the way that a more explicit horror game sets up expectations of scares. This first one is completely unanticipated, which admittedly is working in its favor. After that point, it's known that this is within the realm of possibility, that this is a tool the game is willing to use. But here's the thing. There's a second point later on in Puzzle Agent where a scare happens and it's the exact same structure as the example we went over, and it still worked on me. And I'm not going to mention where it is because it might be nice to leave at least one example that people can experience for themselves. Now, if this first instance just ended here and all the player needed to do was restart the puzzle just interrupted, that'd kind of be a limp conclusion. Fortunately, there's a real impact. The garden gnome runs out into the alley with the fragment of the stovepipe, where the player needs to console a man named Bo, who ended up with the segment. That process is its own puzzle, which, once solved, allows the player to go back and fix the stove. It's not a huge complication, but it has a concrete effect on the events of the game. Now, that's a good meat and potatoes kind of scare, but what if you wanted to push it further? Also, is there an example from another game that supports my argument? Well, buddy, you're in luck. Outlast is designed so goddamn well. The glut of amnesia imitators that came out in the early 2010s is kind of why we're talking about jump scares in the first place, but Outlast still managed to stand head and shoulders above the wave, and is one of the rare pieces of media that seems to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the thing that directly inspired it. And it sure starts out strong, which means I'm about to spoil the first 10 minutes of this game. You should really play it. The player plays as a journalist trying to get an inside scoop about a mismanaged asylum, arriving at the gates at the beginning and climbing through a window to enter the building. Out in the first hall, the player encounters their first blockage, a couple of bookcases with a narrow gap in between. The game then provides a tutorial saying the player simply needs to walk towards the gap, like this, and they'll slide into a sidestep so that they can pass. After this, the player climbs into a grate in a kitchenette area, experiencing a near miss with this guy, drops down into this hall above the lobby, goes through a dark library, and is told that things are bad and that they should escape by, uh, I don't know, some cop. After this, the player exits back into the overlook and comes across a second bookcase gap. Ah, well that's easy, we just learned how to do this. Move forward and shimmy a bit and... Little faith. <laughs> Damn, that is awesome. So, using the model of a gameplay loop from before, the player was in the middle of passing through a gap. The tutorial for this, which was only a couple of minutes prior, established this loop as observe that there is a blockage, make a plan to squeeze through the blockage, do so, and then observe that we can now progress. It's not a particularly interesting or complicated loop, but it still fits the structure. Then, on the second ever usage of it in the game, the player is ripped out of their action mid-execution, right where the puzzle agent scare took place too. The result of this scripted sequence then ends with the player chucked onto the ground floor giving the scare a concrete impact by adding a complication to the plot. But what really puts this example over the top is who is doing this. So this guy is Chris Walker, and he is a very specific enemy in the game. The players viewed what's going to be the most common enemy type from afar, and the real function of these gaps is that the player can go through them, but enemies can't. So they can be used strategically for distancing. But Chris is different. This guy is so aggressive that he can actually reach through these chasms and pull the player out. So, not only does this scare utilize something just taught to the player, jostles the player at the exact right time, and have narrative implications, but it's also its own tutorial. Like, nobody is going to top this for a long time. It's worth noting that the concerns of overuse mentioned in the intro aren't unfounded. Outlast, smartly, doesn't repeat this scripted scare in another bookcase gap later on, because once a particular gameplay loop is interrupted, the player is going to remember that every time they need to perform it again. Squeeze through the little gap. Little piggy. I'm like paranoid that that's gonna happen now. If you're going to use this strategy pervasively throughout a game you're working on, you're going to need to keep switching it up. 
Finally, these rules aren't immutable. There's cases where scares are used as punishment for failure, like Alien Isolation and Five Nights at Freddy's, which don't really follow the format I've argued for. And, as mentioned before, there are games that can't really be described in terms of gameplay loops, and at least a couple of them have provided effective scares. But if there's no gameplay loops, there's obviously no gameplay loops for the scare to subvert. In short, whatever works, works. I just put this out here because this is a set of guidelines that I feel like I could follow if I ever wanted to start creating a startling moment in a game I was working on. Not all scares will follow this, but I feel like if I followed the pattern laid out here, I would have a working start to an effective moment. This is an adaptation of an article I wrote in college several years ago, and a lot of the beats are the same. Talking about gameplay loops, having them interrupted, the great example in Outlast, but most importantly, the examples in Puzzle Agent piquing my curiosity in the first place. Obviously, that gains a little more context in the aftermath of Telltale's closure. What motivated me at the time to write it, and what still bothers me a bit, is how most of the conversation around the work that goes into horror games, and games broadly, was so uncurious. Design work is pretty abstract, and because it's tough to point exactly to what you made, I think that comes with the effect of designers having a tough time finding self-worth. People will say that they know game design is a lot of work, but it seems that understanding how it's a lot of work is less common. Now, not talking about design enough is not the reason Telltale closed, obviously. That's capitalism. And fortunately, the interest in the nitty-gritty of design and the conditions that game developers work within have increased greatly as of late. It's just that, you know, some naive part of me hopes that, maybe, if more people better understood what people go through to make a game happen, that the next time a Telltale situation happens, and there will be a next time, that maybe we won't be okay with letting it happen. <laughs>